Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. What better way to follow this year's discordant political rhetoric than to have a conversation with a pioneer feminist artist? Nancy Azara is a sculptor and printmaker who creates a visual world of beauty that words just can't. And she's my guest today. Hello. It's Thank so nice to have you. Me. You believe that there's art in everyone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And everyone has a creative ability. Um, some people are more musically engaged, some people more visually engaged, but everybody has that ability, and you just have to tap it. How did, it, how did you tap it? Well, I always wanted to, to use my hands, because, and as we know um, now more than we used to know, the hands are really an extension of the mind in terms of creativity. So using my hands um, was something that fascinated me, how the hands became an instrument of, um, an instrument of creativity, an instrument of making it happen. And then, um, much later, I discovered the hand paintings on the cave. When you were young, you used to what? You used to I make I used things? to make doll clothes. I used to embroider. Um, I used to look at things that were fascinating and different. I remember a trip to the Brooklyn Museum um, as a young child, and uh, we were in the Egyptian section, and the teacher was talking about, to fa make the children be fascinated, she was talking about the mummies, um, <laughs> you know, all this about the mummies, and I was so, um, I guess the word is thrilled by being there, and so taken aback by the way people express themselves, that uh, the teacher's sounds um, in her talking, in her speech, were bothering me because I just wanted to look and to be immersed in this experience. And so that was one of the beginnings. And then um, when I went to, uh, as a, also as a student, to the Museum of Natural History, and they did um, a little tableau on Ecuador, or some South American mm -hmm. country, and they gave us little costumes to wear, and I got one to wear, and I remember being thrilled with the transformation. You know, wow. I think maybe the creative process is something that fascinates us because of transformation. Wow. It takes us to a place, and especially here in this world as we live, everything is much more concrete. We have to find a place for everything. Yeah. And then when you work creatively, when either you work with your hands or um, you begin to visualize with your mind, um, you go into your inside, you know, in your dreams, and you see how things come together, and they don't have their little place anymore. Um, that becomes fascinating, and it gives us a, an inner kind of door, or an, a door that opens into an inner self, which then brings us to um, explore parts of ourselves that we never even knew were there. You know, sometimes people become frightened of that, mm -hmm. and uh, because we're so unused to that as people. You've written this great, it's really a primer for... Actually, it is because it be was... A, an art, how to touch your, get into your inner self. Right, how to look at art, yeah. how to think about art, yeah. and um, it's been around for a bit, yeah, it's and great. it's still selling, so yeah, I'm very pleased good. with that. But now, you, you, you've graduated, I assume you went through stages, uh -huh. but you're a sculptor, essentially, sculptor. and you do these wonderful collages and prints. Right. But how did you get to these large pieces of wood? <laughs> Well, it was a journey that took me to study fashion design. And then from fashion design, which was interesting, but it didn't call me. Mm -hmm. um, I looked into theater design, and I became a um, costume designer for the theater. And so I was in my early 20s and uh, began to work with different costume designers and talk about magic. When you work as a costume designer, you put clothes, you, you make these clothes for people, they go on stage and it, the, the transformation is so just a different strong. Person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you can see how uh, one color makes a person some way and another color brings up this other quality in a person. So you begin to become uh, aware of the importance of, of color and form in the world and within yourself. So I was very young. and. Uh, fascinated by that, and, uh, and then it became clear that I just wanted to make the work for myself. I wanted to put those costumes on pieces, on experiences, on wood, logs perhaps. That's interesting. It, it was an evolution. 
it didn't happen overnight, but gradually I became more and more engaged with the, for instance, the tree, because I'm a wood carver. I became more and more engaged with the tree and the tree's relationship to us as humans and to myself and the fact that trees that are felled um, still have a history of what they were like when they were growing. So I um, thought a lot about that. And, uh, and then the tree and I, I say this, I know people think it's a little odd, but it's true, the tree and I have a conversation. You know, um, it's a, <laughs> kind of like a dream thing, experience. So I look at the tree and I kind of touch it and feel it, and it becomes a log then. And then I carve it, and it does become transformed like those costumes in the theater. And then you dress it with these beautiful paints, silver colors. leaf, gold leaf colors. Right. right. And that's the dressing. Right. That's basically the costume. That's right, and it's magical. Yeah. You know, and the costume, of course, interrelates to the spirit in it, yeah. which is the tree and how the tree is then transformed. Yeah. And so it comes together in a way that's very exciting to me. And then, I, I mean, I've all these pieces of work that you have. Do you, you don't have a favorite. Or well, do you, you do get favorites, but you know you get fickle. <laughs> and they change over the <laughs> yeah, years. Yeah, I just, I just love this piece. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> and you know, uh, the creative process has this quality to it that often when you finish a piece, it's the best thing you've ever done. It's the greatest. <laughs> and then two weeks later, you look at it. I'm sure anybody who's written and yeah. worked on even projects, you yeah. know, very simple projects, um, can relate to this in some way. I mean, you look at it and you think, it's, oh, it's great. And then two weeks later, or even the next morning sometimes, you look it's at it and think, so great. what did I do? You know? <laughs> and then you have to rethink and yeah. rework. Or, I, but the, 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 you, you're inspired sometimes by events other than the tree's personality. Of course, right. of course. So the uh, much of, of the your work, mother, the birth of your child. Child, right, the women's movement. Yes. The uh, experience of transforming myself yeah. or seeing that I could do that and, and knowing other women also had those issues. Yeah. Uh, because I, I just know, wanted... at, at my age, <laughs> yeah. I remember this whole time in the 60s and 50s, which was so confined for women. And now in the 60s, it became much more open. So that's all in the artwork. So is there something called women's art? Well, we don't know. And we didn't know when I founded with a group of other women the New York Feminist Art Institute. And that was a long time ago. 1979. That was at the peak of consciousness raising groups right. and things. That's and, right. And so you were a member of a group? I was a member of a consciousness raising group from 1969. And then that group sort of fell apart. So what drew you to 1970. that? 1970. But it's so interesting. What drew you to that first in the first place? Desire. Desire. Were you by then sculpting and doing your... I was. Yeah. And um, much, of us, uh, much of the work that we were doing, the other women and myself, women artists, we were doing in isolation. Yeah. And we had no real way to connect and to see that the isolation was, a, was false, that there was really, I mean, any a woman. good reason for it. <laughs> right. And any woman, of course, at that time uh, who was working in this way also felt the same. But visual artists wanted to express it. And so we began to find women. The art, the art historians began to find women who had been working for centuries, who had been working in isolation, who had been Because they art. weren't being displayed in museums. They, were they weren't represented by, right. by galleries. Right. They weren't part of the market, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It was a man, man's world. World, right. And then they did statistics, and they found maybe, I mean, it's still 20% of the women Isn't that are shown. Isn't amazing? Um, of, the, of the galleries the gallery shows. and the museums, it's still between 20, 23 percent of women whose work is shown. And there are many reasons for that besides just the out and out discrimination. It's that women are making work that's a little different than what the art world shows. And some women get through with that and some women don't. And so um, people have to become more used to the way women work and learn to see it's very hard as humans, I think, to learn to see something different. So women work differently, you think, than men? I think so. And they're inspired differently? Oh, well, they may be because From their they, own have experience. A they have a different experience, not That's, completely your different. Your work is a reflection of, of your, your own life. life right? Yeah. And men also now have gotten more open to experiencing what women are trying to do, mm -hmm. and some of them have taken it over as theirs. 
mm -hmm. uh, which is not an uncommon situation. And um, some of them have just been really uh, supportive and help uh, their uh, fellow artists. Um, but there's plenty of work to be done. We don't really know what women's art will look like for, uh, I think, for a long time. So if there is a women's art, there may not be. Yeah. You Isn't know, that it may cross over. But that uh, is a worthy cause. But there to is a women's perspective. There is clearly. I mean, in all my years in government, I mm -hmm. know that women approach public policy from a different viewpoint. Agreed. It's totally. So it has to be reflective in any of the I work we think. produce. But the, the um, depth of that mm -hmm. and how that manifests itself is still an unknown. Not completely, mm -hmm. because women did make lots of changes. I mean, they made changes. They brought in quilt making as real art, mm -hmm. real in quotes, mm -hmm. um, fine art quotes, because that's how people talked. Yeah. And they still do to a certain extent. So they brought that in um, to the mainstream. Um, they brought working with fabric in general mm -hmm. into the mainstream. Uh, so they brought a lot of kind of um, uh, women's things, like aprons. Like mm -hmm. there was an artist, Miriam Shapiro, who worked with aprons, and she made these beautiful work this she beautiful was, work from Aprons and Doilies. Mm -hmm. She was. She's and she was a part of an early, she was a founder, wasn't she? She of the was the founder of the New York Feminist Art And Institute. so what did you do at the, at the Institute? Well, our basic purpose was to explore women's vision. Mm -hmm. uh, because we had students who came, uh, and many of them were already working artists, but they came, some of them had master's degrees, but they often um, couldn't really work with their own vision because they didn't have the support. Um, when they went to school, they were told that their own vision was weak. Um, oh, I mean, there's a quote you get, girly. Uh, you had that at the... At the um, Art Students League. Art Students League, I right? did. And, um, and then it was easy to say, yeah. you know, you'll make a good wife yeah, to an always. artist. I mean, they always said, you know, they loved saying those things. Um, <laughs> so that's what happened. So many women flocked to us because we were a, a way to then explore what they had lost in art school and mm -hmm. what they had um, been trying to find. You know, mm -hmm. We weren't sure that, we, you know, it's all an X factor. We don't know if you can find it because even when you do feel comfortable with the art you're making, art's a very mysterious thing. It's very fleeting because we're dealing with the unconscious, mm. something that we never see regularly. By the time you started the Institute, had you uh, sold pieces? Were yeah. you in you know, collections and museums and, and commissions? So you'd already been Somewhat. on you. Yeah. Somewhat. Uh, I was a young artist. Yeah. I was um, not as young as some of them because I had been a costume designer mm. for the theater. And I was beginning to do that. Uh, but the obstacles we would meet um, I remember trying to apprentice to um, a major sculptor, and I, he had left an ad. He had a little ad up, so I called, and I said, uh, I'm interested in being an apprentice. You have this little ad. And he said, nothing personal. I just don't hire girls. So that's the kind of thing you yeah, got. Yeah. And also, as I mentioned before, you'd make a great wife to an artist. So these are the kinds of things that women were confronted with. So it was a reinforcement of a woman's art and the perspective that brought that art and the company. It's the whole thing that consciousness raising accomplished. Right, right? and so we did consciousness raising. We were yeah. a group of artists. But it also was the beginning, wasn't it, of what you describe here? Yes. In, in um, 1969, we started to do consciousness raising. We started to look at each other's work. Uh, there were many writers who were out who were, then began to develop their own uh, periodicals. Women Artists News was an early periodical. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia Navarretta, who still comes to openings and things, it's great. Um, Cindy Nemser had a magazine. Uh, so we were beginning to be seen as serious artists. Yeah, right. uh, something to deal with. Yeah. And was Marsha Tucker, she was a, cu a curator. Did she curate an all-women's show? I think it was an all-women's show. Yeah. Um, trying I know, to think but of the, the movement name, was starting. Yeah. But the movement was starting, and Marsha was very supportive. And Marsha was at the Whitney, and they were Whitney annuals at the time. Mm -hmm. And Marsha worked very hard to get women to show, um, mm -hmm. to be chosen to show 
in those uh, annuals. And the fact that she was a curator was also unusual. Women well, were there not was, that many then. There were not that many, yeah. but they were starting to change yeah. a little. Yeah. And Marsha was really a visionary. Um, also, Elka Solomon. Uh, those two women were in my women's group. Yeah. So we had lots of art discussions uh, as well in and out of our meetings. Yeah. And um, Elka Solomon was the, uh, I believe she was the director of prints and drawings at the Whitney. So there was, um, I, did a, I did last year at Fordham a discussion where I had older women artists come and talk about what it was like. And I, I've had a lot of discussions between older women artists and younger women artists. I was going to ask artists. you about that. Yeah, yes. it's a group called Represent, uh -huh. and we meet tri-monthly. It's very easy in terms of meetings and stuff, but we discuss the differences between what happens with older women artists and what happens with younger women artists now and in the past. And Marsha and Elka and all of us, we discussed all of those things at the time. Recently, because unfortunately Marsha is deceased, um, as I had her come to the meeting I did at Fordham to discuss what it was like to be a, a woman activist working in the establishment while women were outside demonstrating. Mm. And she talked about the struggle mm. and, how, um, and how she had to manage both things. So do younger women artists have an easier time? Yes, they yeah. do. Through your work and through talking to the wood and doing all these wonderful things, you're very spiritual. Yes, I do that yeah. with spiritual yeah. things. Yeah. Are, are younger women artists the same way? There's a whole group of them, and there's a whole group that are um, looking towards understanding that better. Um, the reason why I started th this group, the Represent group, uh, which is at Soho 20, and it's um, free, open to everybody, and men do come, um, it's because a younger woman artist said to me, why do these older women artists hate us so much? It's not our fault that they get grants, and that they get galleries, that they get reviewed. It's not my fault. Right. And of course it's not. Yeah. But they didn't understand why we couldn't at the time. Mm -hmm. And now it's not so easy for older women artists in general to get the grants mm. and the galleries and the, the museum grants weren't shows. around then, were they, when you there started? Were, I think there might Very have been one or two. Yeah. There was, um, I got a Gottlieb grant, I believe, in the early 80s. So they were just beginning to develop. I think Gottlieb Foundation mm -hmm. may have just started. Mm -hmm. And then you had to be older for that. Yeah. So. Yeah. But you're an organizer. Where did that come from? Do I know? <laughs> Do I know how we end up having those gifts? I know. It's you know? so incredible, isn't right. it? Yeah. You just go in there and you work in a job. And I did all these jobs, you know, like as a kid, menial jobs. And you say, something's not quite right with this. So you say to your superior, well, I, you know, that doesn't feel quite right. Do, do you think I could work with it a little? And they say, most of the time, sure. Yeah. And then you try it. And then you see, well, I'm organized that. Yeah. And then you just work with it. I mean... How do we know, right? Yeah. It's I mean, it's just something that comes. Yeah, and yeah. I think it belongs to everybody, though. I think everybody Everybody's has that ability. Inside. Right. And it's just a matter, too, of how you But isn't the basic up. thing also confidence? Yes, but you do build confidence, not a lot. This is a wonderful book, and it, it, it starts with the fact that everybody has art in them. And, and also, it combines your belief in meditation or trying to reach inside of you to find what it is that you want to express, right? But in it, you also tell wonderful stories. Your grandfather's the garden, right. and your grandfather was a gardener. Right. How you love the colors. Right. And, yeah. And then you, the, the uh, patent leather shoes. Oh, yes. I love that. Yeah. So all of these were, touching, yeah. yeah, these were all your things that you developed all by yourself, right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, writing and visual art are really that different. I mean, you're still yeah, dealing right. with that mystery. So when um, I was invited to write this book, um, I started to bring those, m those memories up. And um, some of them are much more appropriate as words anyway. So I put them in the book. I love the story about the street lamp because that was really oh, yes. the beginning, right? Right. Tell us. <laughs> yes, the street lamp, yeah. it's about me painting the street lamp, is yeah, that it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, across the street uh, from where my parents lived in the summer, we 
a little bungalow in Long Beach, Long Island, uh, was a street lamp. And it was so magical how it radiated light. So I tried to paint it. And um, it wasn't very successful. But what was successful was how the light radiated and the, the way the form uh, affected me. You know, it was an old-fashioned kind of street light, so it wasn't the ones that come up from high. Mm. It was a low one that mm. had um, sort of a triangle with it, mm. and it just radiated out. So I think that was also part of my early experience of creativity, like what, also making doll clothes, too. Yeah. What piece of work reflects the inner light? I think it's in all of my work. In all of it. I think so, and I think that um, some of it more than others and some of it uh, presents itself as a link. You know, like if you look at one piece, um, sometimes I say, well, I've got to put this other piece next to it because it really needs, it needs it. I mean... Like, what, show us, tell me two pieces, can you? Uh, well, we can talk about this. This is a show I'm having in July. And, um, of next year, yeah. Of next year, right. Uh, in 2017, at the Augustus St. Gordon's a Memorial <laughs> That's a in long New name. Hampshire. And um, it'll be at the, at the, toward the end of July. And I'm going, it's going to be mostly a white show. And I made um, one piece which I call Ghost Ship and one piece which I call Sweet Pea. And Ghost Ship is perfectly lovely in itself. But for the show, there was a piece that I just thought was so wonderful and it was a small tree, and it died. It bloomed mm. and it died. Mm. And so we couldn't figure out what happened to it. So we took it out of the ground and it had no roots. And some little animal mm. went in there and it ate it to the bottom of the roots. So I took it to my studio, and it just seemed perfect to put it next to a ghost ship. So Sweet Pea, while it probably won't be in the same room in Ghost Ship, will be in the same show, because there's an interrelationship and there's a kind of light there. And both of these uh, pieces are about getting older, about mm -hmm. the experience of self as we move on in life and the kind of wisdom we get and the kind of mystery that confronts us. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think that one can sort of go along through life and just walk along through one's life without having to deal with some of these mm -hmm. things. I mean, they do come up from time to time, like the death of a parent or mm -hmm. something like that. But then when you get to be older, you're seeing, well, you know, I, I said to somebody, well, I think I might, we might be interested in getting a 30-year mortgage for our little house in the country. <laughs> and then I thought, 30 years? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you get it. That's what's so surprising. Oh, yeah, probably. Well, my daughter will deal <laughs> yeah, with it, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Now, heart wall. Yes. What, what inspired that? The heart chakra. There's a Buddhist um, prayer which talks about going into the unknown. And, and it's about the heart, which is the center of love and compassion. And um, in my book, I talk about all the different things people relate to in the heart, like heart mm -hmm. warming. Mm -hmm. um, There's a whole list. It's a list, Double, Yes, right. it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And um, so the heart is really attached yeah. Yeah. to all of these compassionate things. things within ourselves. So this was a sculpture that I made about that. It's 20 feet long. Where is it now? Um, it's in storage. Mm -hmm. But for a while, it was at, uh, on Madison Avenue, 44th Street, mm -hmm. in the lobby. So uh, people said they loved it in particular because it's carving. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's wood. And it had this nature quality that the lobby of the building on Madison and 44th Street didn't have, so that the work pe people who worked in the building uh, loved coming in every day and connecting. And the to Johnson that. and Johnson mural. Right. I love that. Oh, thank you. That's so beautiful. Thank now you. that's there. That is there. It's that's a permanent installation. Yeah. Yeah. It was a commission, uh -huh. and um, it's near the emergency room and near the operating room. Mm. Um, so you'd see people wheeled out of the operating room and wake up and look at this gold leaf. Um, piece all along. It uh, comes to 25 feet total, and it, it makes a, an L. So at one end is a five-foot piece, which are hands. They wanted something to celebrate the doctor's hands. Yeah. And so I went and traced the doctor's hands, and a friend of mine who's a physician, who's a woman, 
came with me because I wanted some women to be connected <laughs> because we know that they yeah. were all male doctors. Yeah. Yeah. This is about Especially 10 years ago. Surgeons, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the surgeons and the other doctors, they said, don't tell them where their hands will be because they'll have an argument. And sure enough, <laughs> they were putting their hands up to the wall for the dedication. <laughs> This is my hand. No, it's not. This is your. You know, so we had a good time with that, too. So, you know what? We've come to the end of our time. Oh, why? Am and I we doing? haven't even mentioned the, the different collages and the leaves and the whole thing, more trees. So I guess you're going to have to come back. Well, that would be great. Okay. It was fun talking to you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Nancy so much. and Sarah. Thank, okay, thank you. Thank you. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.